Welcome to Music History Monday for September 12th, 2022. I'm Bob Greenberg, and the title for today's podcast is Robert and Clara Sitting in a Tree. We mark the marriage on September 12th, 1840, 182 years ago today, of the pianist and composer Clara Wieck, 1819 to 1896, to the composer and pianist Robert Schumann, 1810 to 1856. The couple were married the day before Clara's 21st birthday, September 13, 1840, for reasons that will be explained in detail in tomorrow's Dr. Bob Prescribes post. Not for the timid, I ask. What are the most difficult things any person can attempt? To summit K2 and return alive? To win Olympic gold? To overcome addiction? To row solo across the Pacific? My goodness, all tough things to accomplish, no doubt. What are the scariest things anyone can do? Swim with piranhas? Eat at a barbecue restaurant next to a cat hospital? Urinate on Mike Tyson? Scary stuff. Dangerous stuff, that. But to my mind, nothing is more soul-searingly difficult slash terrifying than one, raising children, and two, staying in a first marriage. Okay. I've probably told you more about my life than I intended to, but there it is. Children are to people what water is to a house. Children will find and reveal every flaw in your structure, your personality, while simultaneously sucking dry your money, patience, energy, and creative spirit like a lamprey does the innards of a trout. And yet, our babies make us immortal, as virtually nothing else can. The books we write, the paintings we paint, the buildings we design, and the symphonies we compose shrink to utter insignificance when compared to the life we create. And then, then there are first marriages. By their nature, most first marriages are between two relatively young people, people whose lack of life experience should, in fact, disqualify them entirely from making a decision as important as getting married. But if young people didn't get married, most babies would not be made, which would be problematic for the survival of our species. For better or for worse, getting married and perpetuating the species is not a priority for everyone, particularly for artists, who by the nature of their calling must be selfish with their time and energy. For example, the number of major composers who never married is a substantial one. Whatever their domestic aspirations were vis-a-vis -vis a mate, their needs for unrestricted independence and freedom from any external commitment precluded anything so imprisoning as a walk down the aisle. Such unmarried composers include Antonio Vivaldi, 1678-1741, George Frederick Handel, 1685-1759, Antonio Salieri, 1750 to 1825, Ludwig van Beethoven, 1770 to 1827, Giacomo Rossini, 1792 to 1868, Franz Schubert, 1797 to 1828, Frederick Chopin, 1810 to 1849, Johannes Brahms, 1833 to 1897, Modest Mazorksky, 1839 to 1881, Maurice Ravel, 1875 to 1937, and George Gershwin, 1898 to 1937. We'd observe that collectively, that's a hell of a fine gene pool never to have been passed on. Now, all of this is not to say that composers don't marry. In fact, a few notable composers 
which seem to have had solid first marriages. Although we'd point out that they were solid because their wives took care of everything, allowing their composer slash husbands absolute freedom to do their thing. Among such first and only marriages were those of Felix Mendelssohn, 1809 to 1847, and Cecile Mendelssohn, born Jean Renault, 1870 to 1853, Karl Maria von Weber, 1786 to 1826, and Carolina von Weber, born Brandt, 1794 to 1852, Antonin Dvorak, 1841 to 1904, and Anna Dvorak, born Chermakova, 1854 to 1931, and Jean Sibelius, 1865 to 1957, and Aino Sibelius, born Janefelt, 1871 to 1969. But, unfortunately, the list of tragic or simply rotten first marriages of composers is longer than the list of good first marriages. A lot longer. For example, the first marriage of Johann Sebastian Bach, 1685 to 1750. His blushing bride was Marie Barbara Bach, born Bach, she was a cousin, 1684 to 1720. They were married in 1707. Bach adored her, and Maria Barbara gave Sebastian his first seven children, including the future composers Wilhelm Friedemann, and Carl Philipp Emanuel. In June of 1720, Bach left home on a business trip. When he returned a few weeks later, he discovered that his wife, who'd been hale and hearty on his departure, was dead and buried on his return. Her cause of death is unknown. Bach, who was suddenly the single father of a gaggle of children, ages 12 to 15, was, for a time, inconsolable. Joseph Haydn, 1732 to 1809, was an adorable high-octane man of genius, but he was a devout Catholic, which precluded him from employing professional ladies, and frankly unattractive as an Edsel, which unfortunately turned off potential girlfriends. Desperate not to be a 30-year-old virgin, Haydn married pretty much the first person who'd take him. Her name was Maria Anna Aloysia Apollonia, born Keller, 1729 to 1800. The marriage did not go well. The missus was, by every account, with the understanding that the accounts were written by Haydn's friends and biographers, a shrewish spendthrift who refused to give Haydn children and showed zero interest in his music. Actually, the latter is not entirely true. She used to tear Haydn's manuscript scores into strips and use those strips to curl her hair. They lived separate lives from early on, but never divorced. Haydn referred to her as that infernal beast. You can read much more about this dumpster fire of a marriage in my Music History Monday post for November 26th, 2018, appropriately entitled That Infernal Beast. Wolfgang Mozart, 1756 to 1791, married Constanze, born Weber, 1762 to 1842, at Vienna's St. Stephen's Cathedral on August 4, 1781. Mozart's a adorable father Leopold, bless his soul, did not approve of the marriage. And so he disinherited his son, robbing Mozart of the money he himself had earned as a child on the international concert circuit. Nice wedding gift. Thanks, Pop. In 1826, the 23-year-old Hector Berlioz, 1803 to 1869, fell insanely in love with an Anglo-Irish actress named Harriet Smithson. 
1800 to 1854. Berlioz carried on over Smithson like the crazy, anonymous, stalking stage door Johnny that he was. Smithson and the unrequited passion Berlioz had for her was the inspiration for his Symphony Fantastique of 1830. And then, incredibly, they met, married on October 3, 1833, and had their only child, a son named Louis. But even as all of this was taking place and Berlioz's career was taking off, Harriet's career was tanking. The ingenue roles on which she built her reputation were not appropriate for an actress in her mid-thirties, and she gave her last performance in 1836 at the age of 36. She took to the bottle, became physically abusive, and Berlioz, having to run for his life, took up with a mistress named Marie Recio, a singer at the Paris Opera who was 14 years Smithson's junior. Oh goodness, the marital disasters continue. Giuseppe Verdi, 1813 to 1901, lost his first wife, Margarita Verdi, born Barezzi, 1814 to 1840, and their two young children to disease in a horrific 18-month span between 1839 and 1840, driving Verdi to near madness. The 37-year-old Peter Tchaikovsky, 1840 to 1894, married a lovesick and mentally ill young woman named Antonina Milyakova, 1848 to 1917, in 1877 believing that the marriage would quell rumors of his homosexuality. The marriage lasted three catastrophic months. Gustav Mahler, 1860 to 1911, married Alma Schindler, 1879 to 1964, in 1902. She was 19 years his junior. Mahler wrecked her budding career as a composer and ultimately had to consult Sigmund Freud when he became impotent due to Alma's affair with the architect Walter Gropius. Arnold Schoenberg, 1874 to 1951, alienated and distraught over his first wife Matilda's affair in 1908 with his best friend, the painter Richard Gersel, 1883 to 1908, abandoned tonality forever in his music and embarked on a series of works that changed forever the substance and nature of concert music. Gersel, himself distraught when Matilda Schoenberg, born Zemlinsky, 1877-1923, returned to Arnold in the fall of 1908, burned the contents of his studio, his papers, and his paintings. Then he took off his clothes and hung himself, managing somehow to repeatedly stab himself in the chest while he hung. Yes, he died. To the long list of difficult first marriages, we must now add the marriage of Robert and Clara Schumann. Back to Clara and Robert. Their profound love for each other notwithstanding, Theirs was a challenging and ultimately tragic first marriage. The primary issues were with Robert. He was bipolar and he had syphilis, acquired back in 1831 at the age of 21 from a prostitute known today only as Crystal or Charitas. Despite the fact that Robert was in his latency stage at the time he married Clara, meaning that he was non-infectious and symptom-free. It does remain a miracle that he didn't pass his syphilis on to Clara at some point, as they continued to reproduce well into his tertiary stage. Their first child, Marie, was born in 1841. Their eighth child, Felix, named for their dearly departed friend, Felix Mendelssohn, was born in June of 1854, four months after Robert's mind had snapped and he had been institutionalized. After having been institutionalized for nearly two and one-half years, Schumann died at an asylum 
outside of Bonn on July 29, 1856, his brain having turned into barbecue drippings, or some such. Clara and Robert's wedding which took place 182 years ago today in Schönefeld by Leipzig, a suburb just northeast of central Leipzig, followed an engagement that was fully as harrowing as their marriage itself. The person to blame for all that craziness was Friedrich Wieck, 1785 to 1873, Clara's father. He was a piano teacher who had molded his daughter Clara into one of Europe's greatest pianists by the time she was a teenager. Clara was Friedrich's reason to be, his creation, a walking advertisement for the presumed effectiveness of his piano method, as well as his individual retirement account. So when that lump, Robert Schumann, who had once also been a student of Wieck's, started sniffing around his Clara when she was just 16 years old and Schumann was 25. Well, it was time to nip things in the bud. There was no way on this good earth that that loser Robert Schumann was going to steal Wieck's cash cow. Nip it in the bud! Oh, yes. But in this, Friedrich Wieck was singularly unsuccessful, though it wasn't for lack of trying. For nearly five years after Robert and Clara had pledged themselves to each other, he did everything in his power to keep them apart. He harassed and spit on Schumann in the streets of Leipzig and threatened to shoot him. He intercepted Clara's mail and at times kept her a prisoner in their home. Finally, Robert and Clara had had enough. They sued for the right to be married. And during the summer of 1840, after a seemingly endless series of appeals, their suit was granted. Given the agonies of their engagement and the increasingly tragic circumstances of their marriage, we are tempted to consider Clara and Robert's wedding day, 182 years ago today, as the high point of their lives together. Certainly, Clara believed it to be so. She described her wedding day as quote, the most unforgettable day in my life. My entire being was filled with thanks to him who had finally brought us to one another over so many rocky barriers and chasms. My most fervent prayer was that he would preserve my Robert for me for many long years to come. Oh, when the thought that I might lose him sometimes come over me, I feel I could go crazy. Heaven protect me from such a misfortune, I could not bear it." Unquote. Clara religiously kept a diary from her childhood until September 13, 1840, the day after her wedding and the day she turned 21 years old. Here then is her last diary entry, written the day after she was married on her 21st birthday. Quote, now a new life is beginning, a beautiful life, a life in which love for him is greater than all else. But difficult duties are nearing as well. Heaven grant me the strength to fulfill them faithfully, as a good wife should. He, meaning God, has always stood by me and always will. I have always had great faith in God and will preserve that faith forever." Unquote. For much more on the life of Clara Wieck Schumann, I would invite you to look up my Music History Monday post for May 20th, 2019, entitled Battered But Unbroken. The post marked the 126th anniversary of Clara's death on May 20th, 1893. In tomorrow's Dr. Bob Prescribes post, we return to Robert and Clara's courtship and one of the masterworks their courtship inspired Robert to compose, the piano work Chrysleriana. Until then, thank you.